I'd like to say welcome on this beautiful spring morning, but it's not actually as beautiful as it could be. But we are so grateful to be together to worship God this morning. So let us prepare our hearts and minds as we listen to the organ prelude. Please join me in the call to worship found in our worship guide. Sing to our God a new song. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let us pray together, saying, Loving God, help us to love others as Christ has loved us. Bring us into the spiritual joy of living our lives as your friend and teach us to abide in your love that we may show that love to the world. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit after the organ introduction to sing hymn 313.
seated. We have been called to follow Christ by obeying his one commandment, that we love one another as he has loved us. Let us confess that we have fallen short of loving as Christ commands us. Please join me in unison prayer of confession, followed by a time of silence for personal prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we have not loved you or each other with our whole hearts. We have not always been welcoming or taken delight in the people you put in our path. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us towards fullness. We may be filled with your joy. Be with us and help us to be more like you. Accept these, the prayers of our hearts, whether spoken or unspoken, which we offer in the name of our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And let the people say, Amen. Christ loves us so much that he laid down his life for us and calls us his friends. If we can forgive our friends, how much more does Christ forgive us? Thanks to be God. Let us rise in body or in spirit to sing the new Gloria Pottery found on page 577. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us share signs of reconciliation and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Please greet one another with the peace of Christ.
join me in the prayer for illumination as we, together we pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, in the reading of your word, that we would hear what you have to say to us today. May your Holy Spirit be poured out upon us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the 10th chapter of the book of Acts of the Apostles. It is the story of how God led Peter to the home of a Roman soldier, a non-Jew, and learned that God's love and the church's witness for, is for all people. Listen for God's word. In Caesarea, there was a man called Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send man to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet come down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. And then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By ne no means, Lord, for I have eaten anything that is, I've never eaten anything that is profane and unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what, was, what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is improper for a Jew to associate with or to visit an outsider. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Then Peter began to speak to them. I, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every people, anyone who fears him and, the pra and practices righteousness is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism of that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God, by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commands us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. 
While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. The circumcised believers who came with Peter were astonished at the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they had heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's responsive reading is Psalm 98. Let us share God's word. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness in the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. The trumpets and the sound of the horn Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together to the Lord. At the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with justice. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 15. Continue to listen for the word of the Lord. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do, not, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we all know the watchword about families. That's where they have to take you in. You cannot choose your family, biological, social, or emotional, psychological connections you may or may not have with the group that you call family. But friends come into our lives, and we can choose to pursue that friendship or just let them go. We had friends visit us for a weekend recently from Skinny Atlas. Kip was one of David's roommates in college, and his wife Becky is an Episcopalian priest. They have moved around the country just as much as we have, and she made the comment when they left, how important it was to have friends through our movable lives. It's a gift. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love one another as we are loved by God. And there's no greater love than to give your life for a friend, which is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus teaches and preaches and prays and heals and interacts with his followers he says we're not servants any longer, but friends. 
Jesus chooses us to be friends. And the implication, of course, is that we will be friends with each other. How do you choose your friends? Is it common interests, values, activities? How do you choose who will not be your friend? That's harder. For me, anyone who is rude or nasty, I'll be polite, but they're not going to be my friend. With this in mind, Peter's declaration to the gathered group in Joppa after his vision and Cornelius' vision is this, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable by him. God shows no partiality? That's hard to believe in this day. We have drawn so many lines in the sand, dividing good and evil, so we think, righteous and unrighteous, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, and a few others. What about all the things that we call sin? We disagree over the right to life, the right to choice. We disagree about the use of, of cannabis or drinking ages, or voting ages. We argue in the church over worship styles, no drums or electric guitars in this church. Or as I heard one time at a worship conference, an organist lament, she'd come to church one Sunday morning and the organ was locked and she was told, don't play Bach again. We disagree about the role of children in church, especially in worship, they're disruptive. We disagree about the environment, global warming, fracking. I grew up in North Dakota, and you probably are very aware that Western North Dakota just has an incredible reserve of oil, and they've been using fracking to get it out. Do you know you can see the gas burning from space? It's amazing. We argue about the vet military and how our veterans should be treated. Does the church show partiality? You bet we do. Doesn't matter which side of the issue you're on, we show partiality. The story from Acts 10 is like looking into a mirror. Those first followers of Jesus couldn't imagine the Holy Spirit coming down upon Gentiles. Christians of Jewish descent are absolutely astounded being given even, even to the Gentiles. It looks like the early church had no clue, no idea what God was doing, what God is capable of, or who God loves. Their way is the only way. Their understanding of God is the only right one. So all those Gentiles who've been brought to faith, well, there must be something wrong somewhere. Gentiles cannot be part of the new faith. They cannot be welcomed into the church. Imagine the church behaving badly, not able to see or believe what God is doing in their midst. Quite frankly, I think we can imagine it. Most of us cannot see doing church differently in any other way than what we've been doing for generations. But I was thinking about it this morning, and here's one change that has happened that I don't think we're aware of. There were no worship bulletins 100 years ago. You had to bring your own prayer book and your own songbook to worship, or you wouldn't have a clue what was going on. But we made a change. We started printing up the worship order for everyone to have. We do change. We can't fathom a future that's any different than what the church was like before the pandemic. It's as though we see a tiny little sliver, a glimpse of the sky where God sees the whole universe at once. Maybe we should pray for insight, for aha moments about the church, our relationships with one another, and what Jesus meant when he calls us friends. Peter gets it, finally, and yet if you keep reading Acts to the end, he waffles over and over again because this is hard work. 
It's hard work to look in the face of every human being and realize you're looking at the face of Christ. It's hard work to let God be in charge and to trust that God does new things all the time. Nothing stays the same. Nothing is static. And more often than not, those new things are nothing we could have imagined. I'm sure Peter never thought he would be in fellowship, Christian fellowship, with Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort of the mighty Roman Empire. Wrong. And as we read this amazing story, and Peter is willing to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, which takes him to a new community and new relationships, he's even eating with Gentiles. It just makes me wonder, how do we choose our friends? Perhaps the truth is that for Christians, it is Jesus that chooses. Jesus chooses us and chooses friends for us, puts us into community into brotherhood and sisterhood with one another. When we make the effort, when we're willing to befriend someone who will never be someone that we would choose, then perhaps we're bearing that fruit, that fruit of the Spirit at last. So when we gather together and we find strangers in our midst, we may discover that some of our friends are missing. When David and I did a new church development in Fargo, North Dakota, we would often go out on weekends and preach to share the good news of this new congregation. Well, we were all over North Dakota in little tiny towns and little tiny churches. And we preached for a friend one Sunday. He said, warned us about the woman who would greet us at the door. And sure enough, we arrived early enough to get set up for worship and she met us at the door and she said, what are you doing here? And we explained we were here to preach. She said, well, you've got kids with you. What are you going to do with them? We said, well, they're going to sit in worship. Okay, well, just make sure you keep them quiet. So we went in, and I don't even know which one of us preached. And we got done, and she said, you're not coming back, are you? And I wanted to say, no, thank you. And John, their pastor, was such a warm, wonderful person. I don't know where she got this idea that this was how you welcome people into church because they're not going to come back. Although we want to be together and we want to keep everything the same, as it always has been, the most important thing we do together is gather to worship God. We've made changes since we've been here. And when your new pastor comes, there'll be more changes. So, it may mean that you have to welcome the stranger, genuinely welcome them. And later in the week, certainly those who are not with us, contacting them and saying, we miss you. Peter announced that God shows no partiality. Well, neither can we. The gospel is for all, and we can share that with friends, new and old. So find a friend this week. Seek out someone and genuinely engage them in the name of Christ, who is our friend. Thanks be to God.
friends, let us remain standing and join our voices together in the affirmation of faith, which you'll find in our worship guide. And so together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Once again, a warm welcome to all gathered here and to those gathered online. If you didn't see the note, we are having communion today, and so wherever you may be, if you want to bring some bread and some uh, cup of juice or wine or whatever you have on hand to the table where you are, join with us in this time of fellowship. There are a variety of announcements, uh, both in this morning's worship guide, but also in the newsletter, which is available both on hard copy and also online. If you'd like to receive it online and aren't currently doing so, just let Alicia know, and we'll be sure to get that to you as well. What Nancy didn't mention in her sermon about those many trips to those little towns in North Dakota, she's a born and bred North Dakotan. I'm a Philly kid. I'd get up there, they'd be very polite. Nancy would say, Halloween, she was from Harvey, and her dad ran, and mom ran a, a pharmacy gift shop there in town. So I'd, I know your uncle, or I know this, or I know that. And, and it was instant connections, which I guess among how many? 400,000 people in the whole state? Oh, 600, excuse me, 600,000 still. It's a quality group in every way. But yes, uh, whether it's large or small, local or far away, we still, as they say, we only get one chance to make that first impression, right? And if the first impression is, what are you doing here? That communicates very well. If the, if the first impression is, ah, glad you're here, that also makes a, an imprint on people. So may we be people of welcome and compassion and care as we come into our time of morning prayers. Please note these prayer concerns, both from the Facebook post that Alicia puts out every week, and then also as you enter the sanctuary this morning. Mike's asking for prayers for Tom Coulter, for Paul, and for John and Connie Dudas. Kathleen is asking for prayers for Nanny Gore. Maria wants prayers for Dave Webley, for Janelle Crump, for Cody Yaw. Krista McCallum is letting us know that she's recently been hospitalized up at Newton Hospital. Delaney Lynn is asking for prayers for the Judson family and also for Haley Schultz. Jeffrey Willis is asking for prayers for Sidney Jones, for Audrey Kimball, for Arthur Brooks, and for all fighting cancer. Patty has asked for prayers for Bob Vandenberg. Also, prayers are asked for Lydia, four and a half, recovering from surgery for pancreatic cancer. Prayers for Annie Veely. Prayers for Barbara, for Amy, for Joyce, for Beth, for Molly and Bev, and so many others fighting cancer at this time. Our prayers are coveted for Corey, for Karen, for Ken, for Ruth, for Edie, and for Michelle. Well, brothers and sisters, let us draw our hearts and minds together as we commune with our God in prayer first in a time of silence and then through the pastoral prayer and Lord's Prayer. Let us pray.
Lord God, we bow before you this day. For you are the creator and maker of all things. You spoke the word and things came into being. You fashioned us in your image and you breathed your breath into us. And you call us your friends. It's an amazing thing and we thank you for that connection we have with you, but also for that uh, awesome responsibility and opportunity to be witnesses to your love and your grace, to be those who share your great good news with one another and with the world around us. Show us how to do so in a way that is engaging and magnetic, that leaves people wanting to know more rather than, as is more often the case these days, around the country and around the world, people take the list with our name on it and they just cross us off the list. Help us to be armed with erasers, oh God, that we may maintain the connection. Keep those links growing ever more strong between us because of the love that you've put in our hearts and because of that call for friendship that you have both blessed us with and commissioned us to carry out. So give us insight, oh God. May those aha moments come quickly and often. Help us to endeavor to get it right, knowing we won't always, but yet still to strive to practice forgiveness for ourselves and others. We ask this especially because we know that so often the issues we're dealing with are nothing compared to those who have been named on our prayer list this day, those fighting cancer and other pernicious diseases, those who are looking for answers to their prayers for healing and for hope, those who are underemployed or unemployed, those who don't have the right papers in their hand to be able to stay in this country to provide for their families and meaningful work for them that it does so much for all. Help us, O oh God, to find a way to suspend judgment, to allow room for your spirit, to believe the best about your people and about ourselves, and to trust that you show no partiality, that you have a place for us and for all your children around your table. And so we give you the thanks and praise in the name of the one who made room at the table for us all, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. In response to God's goodness and steadfast love, we are called to respond in gratitude and generosity of ourselves. God has blessed us with so much. In our offering, we are returning a portion of those blessings to God and providing them with the assurance that God will use them to bring about God's kingdom both here and abroad. So let us receive the morning offering here in this place. And we invite those worshiping online with us to take note in the uh, worship guide of the many ways in which you also can express your generous response to God's goodness.
Let us join our voices together in the prayer of dedication of this offering. And so together we pray. Loving God, we have so many reasons to say thank you to you. Your generosity, grace, and mercy are astounding. And we pray that the gifts we offer in worship and throughout the week might be used in your name. Help us to be generous with our money, but also with our talents and time. Strengthen us to recognize your blessings, to be grateful, and to respond accordingly. Amen. Our communion hymn is number 515, Now to Your Table Spread. You may be seated. Jesus shared many meals with his followers, feeding hungry crowds with a little bit of bread and a few fish, gathering with his disciples to remember how God saved the people, and breaking bread with them after he rose from the dead. The Lord's Supper is a meal that we share today with Jesus and with the whole church throughout the world. And as we prepare to receive these good gifts, I invite you to join with me in the opening litany to the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and you sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us, to heal our brokenness. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of the fruit of the field 
and the fruit of the vine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be a communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purposes in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and friends and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in memory of me. This is the body of Christ given for us. Take and eat. After the meal, Jesus took the cup. Once again, he gave thanks to God and then he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. All of you drink of it for the forgiveness of your sins. And so it is that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we remember and we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection and his promised second coming until he comes again in glory.
Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing but connected. What is there we cannot do? Let us give thanks to God. And let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You'll find our closing hymn on page 440. In Christ there is no east or west. So this week, I charge you to go out and be friendly. Find someone to be friendly with. And if they happen to come to this door, don't say, what are you doing here? <laughs> Welcome them. Welcome them in the name of Christ, our friend. And may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the holy communion of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always. Amen.